We're back after a slight delay to some of these Chipotle valuation analysis videos. Uh, back to school time, so I'm getting busy doing a few other things, but I still plan to continue this series. It just might be a little bit slower and all getting released. So last time we left off talking about the conference call transcript. We've been going through the 10K. Today we're going to continue going through the 10K a little bit further. So in this one, we're still moving along. We're on, I think, page 23, 24 of the 10K. And here they're talking about working capital. So we have not required significant working capital because customers generally pay using cash or credit and debit cards. And because our operations do not require significant receivables, nor do they require significant inventory. So if you think of a lot of companies as they grow, one of the big detriments to free cash flows, and remember, we value the company by looking at free cash flows, at least in my analysis. I always like to think of a share of stock as a piece of the company. So I'm trying to figure out what the company itself is worth. And that's based on the present value of free cash flows. So one of the things that slows free cash flows as a company grows is they have to increase their working capital. If you require more inventory, you require more accounts receivable, those things are going to pull away from the free cash flows that you generate. But in Chipotle's case, this is actually a positive because their working capital demands are very small. So as they grow, they're not going to see as much pulled from their free cash flows. So that's a plus. Another thing that takes away from our free cash flows is the idea of capital expenditures. And that's one of the biggest categories that ends up pulling away from free cash flows is how much does the company have to spend? And so here we see for 2019, their total expenditures were about $334 million. In 2019, they spent about an average of $1 million on development and construction costs per new restaurant, or about $0.9 million net of landlord reimbursements, uh, $0.1 million. And then remember, Chipotle's got basically two ways to grow, increase same store sales and increase the number of stores. So as they increase the number of stores, that's going to be key to their growth. In 2020, we expect to incur about $350 million in total capital expenditures, approximately $160 million. So almost half of that is going to be related to the construction of new restaurants. And for new restaurants to be opened in 2020, we anticipate average development costs will increase due to strategic initiatives. Now, at first glance, you might say, eh, that's not good. But it's not as bad because what they're talking about is uh, better design, including the addition of Chipotle lanes. And the Chipotle lane stores have done a better job of generating cash flows than stores without those. So that redesign, it may cost us a little more up front, but if I'm going to spend an extra $2 and get an extra $2 back every year for a number of years, I'm happy to spend that extra $2 up front. Then they're going to expect approximately 140 million in capital expenditures related to investments in existing restaurants, including updating equipment, technology, remodeling. And so that's one of the things that a lot of times people overlook, especially in the restaurant industry, is that you can't just open a restaurant and not spend money to keep it up to date. You need to update the kitchen equipment. You need to update seating. There's lots of capital expenditures that go on to keep your restaurants up to date. Now, something to keep in mind is the cost per restaurant is dramatically lower. Remember, Chipotle has about 2,600 restaurants open. They're going to be opening you know, new restaurants, but they're not opening 2,600. They're planning to open maybe a couple hundred new restaurants, and they're going to spend $160 million they're spending $140 million on their 2,600 restaurants. So a lot more money per new restaurant than is going into each of the existing restaurants. Another thing that's interesting, and this is especially important for the last year or two, is 
leases used to be something that were referred to as off balance sheet financing. They were a contractual obligation of the company, but they didn't show up in the liability section. Recently, we've changed that in the accounting practice so that it shows up as both a liability because they're obligated to pay those lease agreements, but it also shows up as an asset. So it doesn't really affect the balance sheet too much as far as a impact on owner's equity, but it does increase the assets as well as increasing the liabilities. So we're basically adding the value of the restaurants to the asset side, and then we're adding the lease obligations to the liability side. So it's not gonna be a huge net change, but you can see here how they calculate that operating leases are about $4 billion. Those are based on a number of years. So we've got the next several years, but then a huge chunk of that comes in the thereafter category. Now, as I mentioned, that also shows up to the asset side as well. So it's not gonna have an impact on your owner's equity portion of the balance sheet. Inflation, we've talked about this before. Yes, Chipotle is going to run risk of inflation due to cost of ingredients, due to labor costs, things like that. But as long as they're able to pass those costs on to their customers, that's not going to be a problem. And most likely they are going to be able to pass those costs on because think of their competition. Their competition is going to see increases in the ingredient costs. They're going to see increases in labor costs. So all those same higher costs are going to be an industry issue, not necessarily a Chipotle issue. If it was something where Chipotle's costs were going up, but not going up across the industry, then that would be a different story. I'm not that worried as an investor from the inflation perspective. We talked briefly about leases. Their leases generally have remaining terms of one to 20 years, kind of depending on how long ago they entered into those leases, as well as what the specific arrangements were. Most include options to extend the leases for an additional five periods. So what they're saying is that, you know, these leases, we're not worried about our stores just having to close up shop because we lost the right to use that space. Operating lease liabilities represent the present value of lease payments not yet paid. Operating lease assets represent our right to use an underlying asset. And that's what I was talking about before, where it doesn't really impact the owner's equity portion of the balance sheet. It does increase the assets, it does increase the liabilities, but the owner's equity is going to be largely unchanged. Um, impairment of long-lived assets. This is just something every company wants to look at. Are our assets still worth what we thought they were? Is there some specific reason we want to downgrade those? Um, here you can see our estimates of future cash flows are highly subjective judgments. So you want to be careful looking at that. But there are some instances where companies have taken write-offs. Um, I know Kraft Heinz did that a while ago to their brand. And I think Tivity Health did that with their Nutrisystems purchase a while ago. So those do come up occasionally. Stock-based compensation. The main thing here you want to look at is how many new shares are they issuing? Are they really diluting ownership by passing on huge chunks of the company to management? Or are they just using it as an incentive? As a stockholder, you want management to be incentivized to act like shareholders. So you're not too concerned that they're compensating management with stock options or with restricted stock grants. You just want to see that they're not giving away the company to those. Insurance liability. We are self-insured for a significant portion of our employee health benefits. and carry significant retentions for risks and associated liabilities with respect to workers' compensation, general liability, property and auto damage, things like that. Key here is that there is some risk. 
However, predetermined loss limits have been arranged with third-party insurance companies to limit exposure, which means you're not going to see the company go bankrupt because of a uh, risk issue due to their insurance liability. Probably not a big concern. Income taxes. Income taxes are very complicated. You've got state income taxes. You've got federal income taxes. Tax codes change quite a bit. As an investor, one of the ways to get a feel for what the tax rate the company is forecasting is to look at historical data, but more importantly, you can usually get some of that information in the conference call. Oftentimes, management will provide some guidance. Now, in 2020, we've got less guidance being provided by management due to the COVID pandemic, but quite often they provide some guidance as to what they're expecting for income tax rates for the rest of the year and oftentimes for next year as well. So that can give you some idea of what to expect from income taxes. Commodity price risk. Again, here we're talking about uh, ingredients. So pork prices, beef prices, chicken prices, avocado prices, all of those things can go up. Chipotle's probably got a little more risk because of their strategy of how they source their food. They are focused more on smaller farms, and that's going to potentially restrict some of their access and run into a little bit more of a bargaining power issue. But overall, I don't think this is a big concern for Chipotle. Um, one of the things you see here, generally our pricing protocols with suppliers can remain in effect for periods ranging from 1 to 36 months. Several cases we have minimum purchase obligations, so it's kind of both sides are protected. We've kind of set a price. We've agreed to purchase a certain amount, and that's going to kind of protect both sides a little bit. Changing interest rates. Right now we're in a very low interest rate environment which means if Chipotle was going to borrow money, they could do so attractively. Chipotle actually has a lot of investments, $825 million in investments, an interest-bearing cash account. Those are going to be earning relatively low rates right now. What we see in 2019 is going to be much higher than what they're going to earn in 2020. So once COVID hit, we saw interest rates drop, so there's going to be a little less interest income. Interest income is not a big portion of Chipotle's revenues or income, so it's not really a huge concern from an investor. Foreign currency risk. If you remember when we talked about the number of stores, the vast, vast majority, like 99% of Chipotle stores are in the U.S., so they don't have much of a foreign currency risk. In general, I'm not too much concerned for companies on whether they're hedging that risk or not. If you hedge the risk, it's going to reduce your year-to-year -year or quarter-to-quarter -quarter volatility. But over time, it's pretty hard to predict which way currencies are going to go. So there's not a lot of value added to hedging that risk, except for slightly reducing the volatility. For Chipotle, it's not an issue one way or the other. This video looks like we're going to wrap up in under 15 minutes, and I'll start working on the next one.